Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Got a Minute More, the uh, extension of our Got a Minute movie review show on YouTube and Instagram TV. If anybody's watching that, I think we have about four or five views on our videos there. Uh, we are here to talk about more movies that we saw in the month of October. Now that we are at, uh, we're recording this on Halloween. Uh, and by the way, before we get started, uh, let me send a little shout out to our good friend, Wade McFarlane, who, uh, came into work today dressed as baby driver because he looks so much like Ansel Elgort. It's kind of silly, uh, simple costume, but he looks great. If you're watching or sorry, listening to this podcast, you don't watch a podcast. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast on Spreaker or on our website, got a minute reviews.com, you'll be seeing a little picture of Wade right now, uh, in this chapter designation. Uh, one of the cool features of Spreaker is that it allows you to put those little thumbnails in there. So, uh, well done, Wade. Way to go. Um, and thanks also for dressing up just for me, because, you know, I'm such a huge fan of that movie. Let's get to the movies that we're going to talk about today. Uh, Kevin, uh, you and I have three movies to talk about today. Mm -hmm. So I want to start with uh, the sequel to the original Halloween, which, by the way, just turned 40 years old, as we mentioned on the, the last podcast, uh, has just turned 40 years old. And now it has a sequel that essentially erases all of the history of the other nine movies. I think that's probably right. I, I think it's 11 total with this one. Yeah, I don't actually know the exact count, but that sounds about right. I think there's eight in the original, there's the two Rob Zombie movies, and then this. Right. So yeah, it just kind of wipes out the history and retcons the whole thing and pretends that those don't exist, and that the 1978 original uh, is the only one that matters and sort of follows along from there. Uh, the plot, uh, just in basic terms, is that uh, Michael Myers, 40 years after his original rampage through Haddonfield, Illinois, uh, once again gets on the loose. But this time, Laurie Strode is waiting for him. It's still Jamie, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, who, you know, is completely sort of out of her mind, seems to be anyway, completely out of her mind, uh, overprepared maybe, and uh, very, very paranoid, uh, and just really waiting for Michael Myers to get out because she knows it's going to happen at some point. And things uh, sort of progress from there. Yeah, and so I guess uh, vague terms... You, you, I think, like this movie more than I did I think on that's first correct. watch. Yep, I think that's fair to say. Part of my problem is the marketing. I really think that if you're going to make a movie that jettisons the entire canon of the franchise, except for the first movie, this kind of has to be a home run. And I don't think it's a home run. I think it's fine. It's not a bad movie by any stretch of the imagination. But I think it's just fine. And if you're going to take that bold step of saying, ignore all the movies we've ever done in the franchise, I think you need to pay it off bigger than this. Because to be honest, I'm not even sure this is a better sequel than the original Halloween 2. Uh, you know, I, I actually would put it above Halloween 2, but not by a lot. Uh, the verdict that I did give it on God a Minute was uh, good enough. In that it's it's fun, it's entertaining, it held my attention for the, it's, what was it, uh, 90 to 100 minutes, it's less than two hours, it's a pretty short uh, movie. But mm -hmm. um, the stuff that was in the second Halloween movie was so ridiculous, I hated the idea of uh, Jamie Lee Curtis being Michael Myers' sister, uh, Laurie Strode, I should say, being Michael Myers' sister. You know, the, there was none of that here, and, it, and, and I appreciate that it just sort of jettisoned all of that uh, previously canonical stuff and, and sort of forged its own path. We know too, that John Carpenter was not in the mood to make that second movie and that he was sort of forced by the studios. Mm -hmm. So I'm okay with the direction that this took. I don't think it's a great movie by, by any stretch of the imagination. I know a lot of people are saying that it is. I don't think it's great, but I do think it's good. Yeah, and I mean, for me, the best part, uh, not all that terribly surprisingly, is John Carpenter's score, which yes. he came back to do the music for this, is, again, absolutely brilliant. I mean, the original Halloween score is one of the all-time great uh, movie scores, just period, end of discussion. Yes. Never mind, probably the 
most iconic horror movie score of all time. I mean, just anyone can play that on a piano too, and you instantly get the creeps. It's what, like three, five notes, something like that. Assuming that you go with the key changes too, but uh, yeah, it's, and I really thought that he was having heard that he was part of the soundtrack, him and his son. And I believe there's a third composer in there as well, whose name escapes me at the moment. But uh, I kind of thought that they would just be revisiting all of those old themes they do revisit the two biggest themes, which, of course, are the the main theme, the do 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 do, mm. and Laurie's theme as well, which is the slower one and a little more um, uh, a little more tension building kind of moments. But um, there was a lot of really new stuff as well, which surprised me. Yeah, especially the uh, the scene where um, I can't remember many of the characters' names. The granddaughter is running through the town. There's like a very loud jarring um siren type noise right, that right. keeps playing uh it's it's really jarring and really tense uh i really love that specifically what about the um the the new characters in that family as well um i didn't mind i didn't mind judy greer uh i've seen some people saying that uh they didn't like her performance i didn't mind it and i do th- I do think she pays off relatively well in that last moment where, uh, well, we'll avoid spoilers for right now, but, uh, she has a really good payoff at the end. Uh, the daughter, the granddaughter is fine. Uh, the husband, I've seen this movie twice now. And on second watch, I find him even more grating and out of place in the movie. He's meant to be comic relief, but, all of his dialogue and all of the comic relief is really kind of lame and corny. Like there's the bit he does relatively early where he's complaining about spilling peanut butter on his penis. It's just, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, just, I'm laughing because it was bad. Like, and, and I'm remembering how bad that was. Yeah. It just didn't work for me at all. That's Toby Huss, by the way, who I, I really like. He's he was um I remember him primarily as a voice actor. I think on King of the Hill. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember which character he played, but it escapes me right now. But but I'm gonna mention Carnival for the second podcast in a row because he was also in that and he was great. But yeah, in any case, uh, th- there was not for me the the granddaughter. Um, and again, I can't remember her name either. I think I it's say, Allison. I want to say Allison. I was going to say that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so probably confirm that it is Allison. She, the the payoff just wasn't there for her with her character. I didn't think. Um, you know what? Let's uh, let's jump into spoiler territory. Okay. Uh, you t- you talk about the the payoff for Judy Greer's character, um, the daughter of Laurie Strode, who has this whole backstory where she's been raised as Laurie Strode's daughter um, in a very almost militaristic, almost uh, John Connor kind of way. Uh, Laurie Strode, you could sort of argue, is Sarah Connor in this movie, that she's spent years preparing her daughter uh, for the eventual arrival of Michael Myers, the escape and arrival of Michael Myers. And I love that. That's probably my favorite moment in the movie is, is the turn that, uh, that Laura, or Judy, uh, Judy Greer's character takes in that last little moment, the way that she uh, in the end suckers Michael Myers in to coming after her and then just, you know, blows him away basically. Yeah, I thought that was I thought that was a really cool payoff. I thought the uh you know, just the setup to the whole thing. We've seen her basically all movie uh complaining about her upbringing and what it's done to her and then in that moment she starts to say she can't actually do it. She can't shoot someone and yes. the second Michael Myers reveals himself to her, she just shoots him directly in the f- I and yes said, got him <laughs> yeah and has a uh, gotcha uh which it which is which was really clever Allison I guess my big pro- one of my big big problems with the movie is the fact that a lot of characters only exist to be plot devices right and that really is even more grating on second watch. I found, um, I found the podcasters extremely grating on second watch because they're really only there to get, uh, Michael, Michael Myers, mask. The boyfriend, uh, of Allison is only there 
so that Allison doesn't have a cell phone for the second half of the movie. Because yeah, which is really unfortunate. That's a wasted opportunity to like that boyfriend, the cheating boyfriend in the Halloween franchise previously anyway, would have absolutely gotten some sort of comeuppance for that. Yeah, and he exactly. does not, which is really disappointing. Yeah. If, it, if he were in the movie for those two things, then I could, you know, like the, the uh, losing of her cell phone and for getting his comeuppance, that would be great. I'd be fine with that. That would be completely within the scope of the Halloween franchise. But yeah, that that's a complete missed opportunity, if you ask me. Yeah. And on second watch, um, so the biggest problem we both had, and this is absolutely not a defense of it. I still think it's a terrible decision and a really stupid plot twist. Uh, the doctor's turn is set up slightly better when you watch the movie back for a second time. Okay, explain. So there are there are several moments where he, when Michael Myers is initially getting transferred out of the prison, he has a couple lines of dialogue um, where he says like, "Michael Myers is my patient. Um, I'm going to see this through to the end." And then don't worry, Michael, I'm going to be there with you, which kind of kind of implies what is later hinted at, that he's the one that breaks Michael Myers out of the uh, prison bus. And then there's a long dialogue scene in the car with the sheriff who he eventually stabs. That's the plot twist turn um, where he's talking about like how much he wonders what it's like to take a life, uh, what that does to a human psyche and how frustrated he is that Michael won't talk to him to explain that to him. Mm -hmm. And when he does eventually stab the sheriff, he has a line where he's like, Oh, that's what it feels like. And I'm not defending that as a plot twist to be clear, because I, I think it's really, really stupid. Right. But it is set up slightly better than it comes across on first watch. Well, I, I'm even so it's it's still it leads to probably my biggest problem with the movie, which is the complete waste of what could have been the most intense scene in the entire franchise, which is after the doctor kills the cop, uh, he picks Michael Myers up. Puts him in the an unconscious Michael Myers, by the way, puts him in the back of the car with Allison. We've determined her name to be now. Uh, and almost immediately. So so you've you've got one of the, like the the final girl, if you want to call her that. She, Allison was sort of being set up to be the final girl, the same as uh, as Lori was in the first movie. You have her in the back of this car. It's a police car with the cage uh, that separates the back row from the front row uh, and locks that you can't uh, open because you're a prisoner, you know, presumably rather in the backseat of this car. Michael Myers is sitting in there with you directly beside you. And almost immediately he starts to wake up and he uh, breaks through the cage and kills the doctor. Yeah, uh, I mentioned this when we got out of the theater. That was one of my biggest problems with the movie, too, is the complete absence of tension in that moment. There are there are a few other scenes where it also applies, but that's the biggest one by far. Yes. And I specifically mentioned, if you want to see that scene done properly, in Scream 2, there's a very similar scene to this, where... Uh, Sydney and someone else are in the back of the car or in the back of a police car and the ghost face killer is in the front of a car in the front of the car and there's a car crash and he's knocked unconscious and they have to get out and it's this huge like six or seven minute long scene right with tension throughout the whole thing like they're they have to climb over him basically to get out of the car and is he gonna wake up there's which is there's... great i mean you have a similar thing that happens in the original halloween as well where of uh, the the famous closet scene one of the first things that laurie has to do in order to get out of there is to step over michael myers unconscious body and it's mm-hmm. a very brief scene but well at least that portion of it where she has to step over him uh, but but again, it adds that tension, and there's almost none of that in this back scene or backseat scene where it really could have been just absolutely 
drawn out forever. He's very, very slowly waking up and he notices, you know what I mean? It just could have been so much more and it was was such a missed opportunity. Yeah. And I I mean, I also have a big problem with the way comedy is used in the movie. It undercuts a lot of the tension and some of the scenes just really don't work. The Bon Me scene is kind of like legendarily bad now already. (laughs) Um, I mean, that would have been a great scene in, in, you know, Pineapple Express or any of the other Danny McBride and, um, david gordon green comedies yeah that would have been a hilarious scene it was really well written well performed but in the context of that movie just completely shuts everything down yeah such a drag in any case uh, there was still a lot of good in it i thought there was still a lot of uh really interesting um um the the one sequence where the, the single camera shot where myers is strolling through the neighborhood in Haddonfield and just killing at random, essentially. I thought that was really, really well done. But uh, And actually, I kind of like the bathroom scene, even though it was sort of derivative of another bathroom scene previously in the Halloween franchise. I can't remember which one that was, uh, four or... I think something it's, like that. Yeah, I think it's later than that. I think it's like it might have been, five or might six seconds. Yeah, remember. might have even been H2O. But in, in any case, uh, I thought that was pretty well done. But, uh, you know, overall, I, I, again, I thought it was good enough. And I, I don't think I've seen a better Halloween sequel personally. Again, I haven't seen the entire franchise. But, but for me, I don't think I've seen a better Halloween sequel. It's still not anywhere close to the original, which I just watched the other night as well as part of uh, the Rearview series. So unfortunate that it didn't live up to that yeah uh yeah that's i mean that's ultimately my biggest complaint is if you're jettisoning jettisoning is that a word jettisoning it is jettisoning um yeah got it uh (laughs) if if you're doing that to the entire (laughs) franchise uh i think i think the movie just has to be better like i was thinking of it like if james cameron came back and wanted to make a terminator movie again and he said, we're ignoring Terminator 3, Terminator everything after Terminator 2. And this is the true Terminator 3. That's fine if you want to do that. But Terminator 3 had better damn well be good then. Because otherwise, it's just an empty marketing gimmick. And I felt like some of that is kind of what we have here. Yeah, fair enough. All right, moving on, our second movie of the day is uh, First Man. Um, First Man comes second in this situation. Uh, It's a biopic about Neil Armstrong and uh, the Apollo 11 mission, the race to the moon against the Russians, but it's really heavily focused on Armstrong himself uh, and his family and and the things that were going on in his personal life uh, as he set out on this kind of historic adventure. Uh, Damien Chazelle directs La La Land, Whiplash. Um, what else has he done? Oh, it's there's another one. So this is one thing I wanted to correct. I said that he had only done directed three movies at this point, or that this was his third movie that he directed. It's actually his fourth. Uh, I was forgetting about his uh, debut film, which was Guy and Madeline on a Park Bench. I haven't seen it. Uh, he wrote and directed that one. I said that he had only written and directed two movies before this. I was wrong. My apologies. Uh, in any case, uh, this is, uh, it's a fantastic movie. It's a must-see movie, but it's also a little bit flawed on the, I want to say, on the, the script level. I mean, it's, it is and it isn't, right? Because the the problem is with the character you're actually studying here. Part of the part of the story is how singularly focused on getting to the moon Neil Armstrong was. So when the script has dramatic beats in it, uh, different moments in his life that led up to it that are very dram- that would be very dramatic in another movie, they don't play that way because he's so singularly focused on his task that he just kind of pushes everything aside. So what could be a very dramatic movie kind of isn't. Which is fine. And, uh, you know, as I say, I, I believe I said this in the review as well, that 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 is probably a problem with the character of Armstrong himself is that, you know, he, he turned everything else aside uh, and was a very quiet and internal man uh, and, and not very showy and melodramatic or anything. But the problem is as well that that, 
doesn't necessarily make for good cinema. It makes, I think it makes for a great book. And remember that this is based on a, an authorized biography of Neil Armstrong from a, a writer, again, whose name escapes me. I got to do my research before I start doing these. <laughs> um, the, the, this particular writer, though, sat down and spent many, many, many hours with the Armstrongs uh, and, and got all this great information. It doesn't necessarily make for a great movie, though. The thing is that the the other parts of the movie where we're dealing with the space exploration, where we're dealing with the the science and 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 the uh, the absolute danger that these men are putting their putting their lives in, uh, they are incredible from a technical standpoint. Maybe the best I've ever seen. Yeah, that's where Damien Chazelle absolutely just absolutely knocks this out of the park. There's there's so many elements to any time that they are in a spaceship or about to go to space that make this movie so much more than the missed dramatic beats that uh, ultimately kind of hold this back from being a truly like unbelievable movie. Agreed. And, and it's the way that he shoots and the way that the production quality and everything of all of those other moments. And it's not just the fact that he shot in IMAX. It's everything is very close up on his face. Right. When you're, when they're going to space, you only ever see inside the spaceship and their view out of the spaceship. There aren't, there aren't the um, gravity type of, like gigantic takes of the outside of the spaceship hurling through space. Right. The only Showing time camera moves and that sort of thing. Yeah. The only time you ever see the outside of the spaceship is when they show you them looking out the window and what they're seeing. And I think there's, that's there's one minor exception to that. And that's the, the Gemini eight mission where, where, you know, spoiler alert for something that happened in real life. Um, mm. the, the, the ship starts to spin out of control because of a faulty thruster. Right. Um, yeah. so that's, that's the one I think exception where they actually take the camera outside, but it looks like it's a, it's a camera that's mounted on the outside of the ship. And in fact, uh, if you look this up, you will see that there was a camera mounted on the outside of Gemini 8, which was capturing that spin as it just got faster and faster and faster and faster. So, you know, not uh, not necessarily a showy Hollywood type thing to do because they were just sort of mimicking what was actually on board that ship. Yeah. So those uh, those moments where they're in a spaceship feel so claustrophobic and they do a really good job with sound design and production design as well of making Mm -hmm. it feel as dangerous as it was at the time, because they really were pushing the limits of technology and our advancements at that point that, you know, just little things like the fact that when they get in a spaceship, it'll just like creak or crack or like you'll hear just little clanging noises or something. And you have, Mm -hmm. you have no idea what it is. And I'm sure that was like that and it's utterly terrifying when you're trying to get to another trying to get to the moon yeah and there's several times that they mentioned too like just how you know like perilously thin uh, and light that these materials are because they had to be in order to you know conserve the fuel um <laughs> just in, in insane that anyone would voluntarily put themselves in that situation Although for a chance for the trip to the moon, I I might actually do that. Um, (laughs) Speaking of uh, just getting into spoiler territory here quickly, um, we don't want to spend too much longer on this movie, but the sequence where they actually land on the moon, there is one of the most, to me, one of the most breathtaking, like literally breathtaking, the air was sucked out of my lungs moments. And that is, so the entire movie is shot, as you say, in handheld. It's grainy film. It's it's meant to look gritty and, and documentarial. That's that's not a word mm-hmm. either. That's that's not at all a word. We'll documentarial. Go with it, okay, thank you. Um, and it's all of a sudden in this one moment where they open the hatch, where the, the lander, the Eagle has landed um, and, and they open the hatch, the camera, as well as all of the air in the, in the, uh, in the lander uh, and all of the air in your lungs gets sucked right out into the moon. And you're left with absolute pitch silence. Uh, pitch silence is not a real thing either. Um, you're abs- left with absolute silence on the track and, and, 
just this incredibly gorgeous, clear, beautiful shot IMAX, uh, if you did manage to go and see it in an IMAX screen. Clarity, beauty, serene, quiet, just gorgeousness. It's one of the most breathtaking moments I think I've ever been a part of in a movie theater. Yeah, that entire sequence of them finally getting to the moon is, it's the last half hour or so of the movie, is as good a 30 minutes of a movie as you're going to see. I have my problems with the way the movie plays until then, but that last 30 minutes is easily, easily, easily worth the price of admission, and is easily going to be worthy when Damien Chazelle inevitably gets nominated for Best Director and the movie gets nominated for Best Picture. For sure. Um, and there, so just one quick little thing as well. I, this one I did do a little bit of research on. Uh, there, There is a little plot device where he, this is not necessarily a real life thing, but it very well could be. Neil Armstrong has a little moment to himself by uh, a creator that's called the Little West Creator. Uh, and this actually happened on the Apollo 11 mission, where he just sort of wandered away from the lander. Buzz Aldrin's do- off doing his thing. I believe in the movie he's just sort of bouncing up and down, playing with the very low gravity on the moon. And uh, he takes um, out of his hand, or he, he opens his hand to reveal that he has the bracelet uh, of his daughter, uh, his daughter who passed away at the age of two. And this is the sort of the thing that sets him in motion for, you know, this journey and, and, and sets him on this, on this path of making sure that the science is right for this mission, the way that the science failed his daughter mm-hmm. and, and the brain cancer that she has. He opens his hand, we see the bracelet and he takes a moment and then drops it into the crater. Now, apparently that could have happened. They don't know why Neil wandered over to the crater as he actually did in the mission. I th- think the quote from his wife was, uh, when when asked, "Did he? Do you think that he could have taken something of Karen's up there?" I believe her quote was, "My God, I hope he did." So yeah, I you know I I really hope that that little moment is real and it very well could be and I I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. I've seen a lot of people comment on that like, "Oh, there's no way he did that." It's entirely within the realm of possibility that he did do that or something similar. So I thought that was a really nice touch and something that I at first thought was like, ah, there's probably no chance. I looked it up and sure enough, there was this moment where it could have been that way for him. All right. So enough on First Man. Uh, Now moving on to a movie that I haven't seen, a documentary that Kevin just got back from seeing today. Free Solo. Kevin, take it away. Uh, So Free Solo is a documentary about rock climber Alex Honnold. I'm not 100% sure if I'm pronouncing that name right because his full name is rarely, if ever, said in the movie. And it is essentially a documentary about his quest to solo climb uh, El Capitan uh the crest el capitan at um yosemite right and it is it is honestly so spectacular uh it is probably now my favorite documentary i've ever seen really it is definitely one of the best movies i've seen this year it is jaw dropping like wow. all the way through it is he is such an interesting character and the movie doesn't the movie doesn't shy away from so many things that um that you would expect a movie like this to shy away from for example right. uh the documentary team uh all the directors and all the camera people have been, are basically traveling with him everywhere he goes rock climbing for the better part of a year and when he's getting ready to climb Al Capitan, they they become characters in the movie in a very like visceral way. Because okay. Alex will constantly talk about how he's more scared climbing the mountain with his friends watching him and filming it because what if he falls? Right. Um he he basically says like 
I've made peace with the fact that if I fall doing one of these solo climbs and die, then that's the way it is. But I don't want my friends to see it happen. Right. And it adds this incredible extra layer where the camera people are constantly talking about it too, you know. Um, I'm just going to kind of skip around here because this is very fresh in my mind. But during the end of the movie, which is obviously his him climbing El Capitan, mm-hmm. um, one of the camera people literally cannot even look at look through his lens finder. He can't watch a single second of it. He's too scared to watch him do this. Right. Um, it is... It is an awe-inspiring physical athletic feat captured through the lens of this character who, very similar to First Man with the way Neil Armstrong is presented, is so singularly focused on this task. And there's so many interesting moments in the build-up to it where he'll be talking about different things talking about his relationship with uh, women he'll be talking about his relationship with his family he'll be talking about uh friends he has he'll see there you know there are scenes where he's looking on his phone at articles about people he knows who were other solo climbers having died oh, man. like he's He's getting ready to perform the most dangerous solo climb ever at this point, and he's looking at articles of friends of his dying doing this. And there's a specific beat where he falls uh, while he has a harness on, and he damages his ankle, and he still won't stop. He still wants to do it on a sprained ankle with torn ligaments and the presentation of it is very is very clever as well i don't know i'm sure they just filmed everything and said we'll figure out how this movie pieces together once we get into the editing bay the way they present it is very interesting because he is very very meticulous in preparing to do these things so he will climb up these mountains or these hills or rock faces or whatever you want to call them. He'll Mm. climb up them, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times with a harness and basically map out. Like he has a diary, which has every step and every movement mapped out. Yeah. He has every single step that he needs to take every body movement and adjustment that he needs to make to do this without a harness and in mapping that out you and him learn all the danger moments of his climb right so the movie will give you the names of all those moments you know there's uh i can't remember all of them off the top of my head but there's the first one that he gets to which is a problem section which is where he falls and sprains his ankle There's another moment which is called uh, the boulder problem, which is like he says the hardest 10 feet. It's he he faces two choices. He either has to do like basically the splits over a gap Mm -hmm. and hold on to at one point he's going to be holding his body weight up by his thumb (laughs) or he has to jump across it, like literally leap and he eventually chooses the thumb thing because he's like, I can't bring myself to do a jump without a harness. Right. Uh, so you learn all of those like most tense moments so that when he's eventually climbing it for the final time uh, without the harness, you get those moments of tension where it's like he's approaching this. Oh, my right. God, this is where he's done this, you know. We see him face the boulder problem 10 or 15 times and fall almost every single time. So it's like there's the music is brilliant. The cinematography is spectacular. Mm -hmm. Uh, Basically, the director hired a team of rock climbers to film everything. So they're on on the wall with him. Mm -hmm. They're 
on ropes around the wall. They're using drones. They're using, they're climbing behind him. They're doing all these different things. So they have all these angles. It's spectacular, uh, spectacular cinematography. And he is just a super, super interesting guy. There's scenes of him explaining like, you know, I don't want to have a girlfriend because that gives me something to live for. And maybe doing what I do, I need to not have anything to live for. But then Yikes. but then later on, he does eventually get a girlfriend like he meets someone that he genuinely loves. Right. But even that is extremely rocky as well, because she is obviously nervous about him doing this. Extremely just, rocky, eh? <laughs> yes. Uh, the pun was the pun was unintended, but uh-huh. it's great all the same. Yeah, it's 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 a jaw dropping movie. It really is. It's spectacular. It's one of the best movies of the year. One of the most tense, gripping movies that I've seen in a very very long time. Free Solo. Go see it. Yeah, that's uh, that. Uh, consider that my longer version of a got a minute review for that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit longer than a minute. Yeah, but that works. Yeah, that's what we're here. That's what we're doing this for, right? That's the whole yeah. point. All right, folks. Well, you heard it here. Uh, all three movies. I think we could probably recommend going to see uh, Halloween yeah. first. Halloween's right on the edge there, uh, but First Man for sure and Free Solo apparently is just an absolute must see. So I must see it. Yes. I, I mean, <laughs> what, what else can I say? All right. Uh, that about wraps it up for this edition. Uh, Kev, what are you looking forward to in November? Uh, I am looking forward to Friday when I can finally see uh, Luca Guadagnino. I'm guessing at the pronunciation there's a uh, remake of Suspiria. Uh, yes. Limited release, I think, to start with, or is that... Or is it in limited release now? Uh, so it's in limited release right now. I think it goes wide on Friday, if I'm not mistaken. Awesome. And it's up against Bohemian Rhapsody, which apparently is okay, but not yeah. okay. Yeah, I've seen, um, I've seen some relatively strong criticisms of that movie, and... To be honest, part of me was always a little bit concerned about it because of the stories of Brian Singer being fired halfway through directing it. Right. Um, but yeah, Still gets it's full credit though. Yeah, that's very odd. Uh, I don't. I don't know exactly like the legality of uh, crediting people, but yeah. yeah, surely there's some director's guild stuff there. Uh, in any case, uh, we'll have those reviews for you, I'm sure, and more on Got a Minute. Uh, make sure you follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Got a Minute Reviews on both of those, uh, and of course our website, Got a Minute Reviews dot com. We'll be back with another episode probably in a couple of weeks or so. Uh, in the meantime, have fun because how could I possibly be more lame than the first ending that I had? Uh, you, I think, actually accomplished that. So congratulations. I think I just managed it. Thank, thank you for, thank you for really building me up, friend. Oh, no problem, pal. 